Yeah, that's true. Oh, there's an echo. Yeah, can yeah. you? Try. Let's see. Hello, 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 hello. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay, good. Okay. So actually, the real title of my talk is this one. Yeah. So when it's a square, square. So actually, as Martin has said, right, it's where GL meets geometry. Ultimately, what I can answer you today is just this question. Yeah. So don't ask me too many. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I will talk about some geometry. And then we'll talk about, uh, from a geometry perspective, what is the Gormov dihedrology conjecture? Then I will go to GL, talk about positive mass theorem. And quasi local mass will be an important topic as well. So if you have time, we can talk about Gormov spinning conjecture. Actually, it echoes with the previous talk about the uh, filling of the public in this data set. Yeah, if you have time. So, first of all, as a geometer, right, we talk about scalar curvature. Sorry, can we oh, minimize the. Oh, the thing at the top. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so for uh, curvature, when we compare a ball in a particular metric to the Euclidean standard ball, right? Then we have this formula. So in the sense that we can tell that if the scalar is positive, which means the volume of the thing is smaller, actually. So somehow it's saying that, okay, the density is smaller, so that I can occupy more thing. Well, for the mean curvature, we talk about, okay, for closed hypersurface, in the ambient manifold, right? so say there is a smooth family of the surfaces. We can say mean curvature is really measure the change of the area. We can say that the change of the area is the integral of the mean curvature. So we can say that if the mean curvature is positive, the area is increasing. So it's like expanding. We can imagine something like convex expanding. So these are two important concepts in geometry. So now we talk about curvature and polygons. Because usually when we study geometry on a smooth manifolds, even the boundary is being smooth. But what about the boundary having some corners, having some intersection like this? So we have this beautiful gauss bonnet theorem. So correspondingly, right, K here is a Gauss curvature, which means the scalar curvature, and kappa here is a geodesic curvature, which is exactly the mean curvature. So we have this beautiful formula. So what can it imply is that let's see a picture here. First of all, for a triangle on the flex plane. Here. You can tell that, okay, the angle here is intellectual, so it is part of three. And of course, the curvature here is zero, here is zero, and because it's straight line, right, the geodesic curvature is zero. So it fits in the formula. Then while well, we see the other thing, that is a triangle on a sphere. So here you can tell that actually the angle here is power two, it's bigger. Why? Because actually the curvature of the sphere is strictly positive. If you set the one. So that's why the angle is bigger, so that the scales for the sphere is satisfied. So what you can tell from this basic picture is that okay, the curvature corresponds to angles. It is the concept that we can see from a two-dimensional gauss bonnet theorem. So on the other hand, we can say that, okay, we can tell whether the curvature inside positive or not by just observing the boundary. Because again, by this formula, we know that given important boundary information, I can determine what happens in the interior, the capital K. So say, for example, given a polygon, if any of this equality is strict, for example, the geodesic curvature is strictly positive, but the angle is strictly less than the Euclidean model, then we can say that the interior cannot admit positive curvature everywhere. So it's just a consequence of this equation. So the next question we mathematicians actually ask is, what about in high dimension? What we can do? Okay, so let me, Talk about the statement of the conjecture first. So let P polyhedron, is that a question or? Oh, no, it's just oh. somebody joining. Oh, okay. So let P be a convex polyhedron in Rn 
But complex environment level with boundary is said to be of type P as follows. So say for example, it's a general. But this is the cube. Did it miss a diffeomorphism into a standard cube? Which is a diffeomorphism, not isometry. So it can map into here. So it's called reminding manual of type P. This is a standard model called type P. So P here just means for the hinge joint. It can be a prism. I mean, for example, a hexagonal prism or a cube, just general for the hinge joint. So it is definition. So what we can ask is the following. Okay. Do we have three dimensional or even higher dimensional gas bonnet field? So Gormov asked this question. Okay. So given manifold itself has non-negative scale curvature, and each face has non-negative wing curvature. Well, the dihedral angles are if you're less than equal to the Euclidean model. So would this manifold actually is only the case, the Euclidean case? So let me again join the picture here. So you can see that, okay. It's mean complex because mean is like expanding, right? Mean curvature, not that mean expanding. So it's like curves like this. But then actually, you can tell that the angle is less than or equal to the Euclidean model. It's impossible because the model is powerful too, right? Exactly this one. How come you have mean complex boundary while the angle is more than the, the original one? So this should be the only case, just like what we have seen for this uh, triangle's pictures. So this, actually, this question makes sense. And if you don't believe it, right, let me show you how to prove this. So you can see there's a juice box. Then you blow this up. Then you can see all the, all the faces are convex, right? All the faces are convex. And the angles is strictly greater than power two. So that's why if all the things are satisfied, it must be the original flex one. It must be, it must be. We, we, that's how we prove it. But of course, it's a joke, right? Because we are mathematicians, yeah. Okay, so next thing, okay, let me talk about this. It's very difficult, but we tell the detail, I mean, not the detail, of course, impossible, but we tell the idea very easily. But let me talk about the statement. What we have achieved so far is the following, right? Uh, Charlie has shown the following. That is, for dimension from two to seven, if dimension is three, it can be an arbitrary simplex. Of course, it's a remanent polyhedron. We can say that, actually, it is true. So the statement is as follows. R he is a scalar curvature, it's a mean curvature. And the angle again is the Euclidean model. It's more than Euclidean model. Then it must be isometric to Euclidean for the key joint. Just restate the statement. Uh, sorry, what's, yeah. the, what's the comma after the, what's the alpha after the C2? Oh, C2 alpha is a, uh, this is a whole that continuous. Even the second derivative, it's all, yeah. I mean, uh, C2 is a uh, second derivative, it's continuous. Yeah. But actually, it just has slight, uh, slightly better property. Yeah, so let me show you a simple picture here. So which means the C2 derivative has a behavior Bounded by some fixed alpha. So, for example, this is the, C, the second derivative of the function. It is as good as this. It will not go up like this, but it will be bounded between this parabola. Uh, sorry, this curve. Yeah. So, it's some nice property of the of the metric. It's moving enough. At least, moving enough. Yeah. Okay. And then, under slightly different assumptions, there are other proofs by Brando and Wang Seiyu recently. Yes. Okay, so now we talk about ideal proof. Actually, I mean, yeah, it's just, just like, uh, it's like asking my niece to do the math. Yeah, the idea is at least six. Again, let me draw the picture over here. Right, because it's convex, let me draw an exaggerated picture. Oh, maybe I should use it. Sorry, I can use this part so that you can see it easier. Okay. Then because convex, I want to seek an area minimizer. So we know that's great. Area minimizer must be flat in a certain sense. Because if it's not flat, if it's not flat, then I can always seek a factor one to make it the area smaller, right? So that's why the area minimizer must be flat. So it will not be this one, it will not be this one. But instead, it will be this one. Okay, yes, area minimizer. But then you may say, well. It should be smaller, right? It should be smaller. So that's why let me draw this picture. It tells us the following. Actually, okay. The picture shall look something like this. Again, I saturate. Okay. 
So it tells you that the original picture is not that. It should be like this because you minimize it. It's more than this one. Okay. Then actually, it's a very interesting technique. Let me mention the name. Yeah, that name here. It's a chosen source HMS perturbation metric. You see that, okay, I can perturb the, the geometry of this a little bit, just a little bit. Then I can form another piece of area minimizer, say for example here. Okay. So that, what does the picture look like? It could be something like this. I can use reflect. And we can do this we can do this process, I mean as much as you want. So at the end, what does it look like? We will be okay. Then all the fast service will be here. Then of course at the end, when we take the limits, then we know it is exactly and all the things here are flat. That's how we see the proof of this conjecture. That's how we do this. So the key idea is, so, so, sorry, yeah. is so the area minimizer like introducing another like vertex? Is that the idea? Like, oh no, that? there's uh, there's uh, I mean the the picture is uh the vertex is not the idea, but say if you're squeezing it, you're squeezing it. Yeah. But just like your belly is supposed to be a fattest part, right? But it turns out that it is your thinnest part. So the way the whole thing must be the same area. This idea, right? You know it is a fattest part, but actually I tell you it is an area minimizer. So the only thing is possible is that okay. It must be something like this. It must be something like this. It may be smooth, not the vertices. It might be smooth. Right? Yeah. And then you squeeze it again. You say that, okay, there's a belly here. Oh, but, okay, actually, it turns out it is not a belly. It's again, it's again something like this. And you do this continuously for every height. That's why it turns out that every height, the area is the same. Then it must be a Euclidean model. Right? Does it make sense? Yeah, which means you have no belly at all. You're so fit. You have six packs. <laughs> that's, that's what he's saying. This is what exactly what he's saying. Okay. So now we have the geometry. Of course, I made some generalization to hyperbolic space. We have the corresponding statement. So we can model um, uh, uh, a structure being negative. So it's a hyperbolic metric. And then again, there is some uh, prism case done by Charlie, and there is some of uh, my friends, uh, Xiaoshan Chai and the Gao Ming Wang, they have done the general uh, prism, like a pyramid. Just to mention with some results. So now, okay, let's go to here. Because I, I promise, right? It's about some energy, right? Energy and geometry. I talk about geometry, now I want to talk about GR. What is common of a uh, common thing between the Euclidean space and the hyperbolic space? So let's see the following. I'm going to draw here. It turns out that, okay, there's a space X is T, the time says it's in Cauchy space. So what is R3? Just any flat plane, right? For example, here, any space like flat plane. These are all R3. And then what you can do next is that, okay, what well, is hyperbolic? Hyperbolic space is actually the hyperboloidal model. Right, this is hyperbolic. It's free in a multiple space. It's just arbitrary out here. Okay. So what we can do more, the following question is, what you can do, we can identify some polyhedral piece of data with angles and corners in hyperbolic space and hidden space. Then what about, in general, any space size size in the space? For example, this one, can we identify it? This one, can we identify it? What? Or this one? They are all space size, they are all sitting in the space. How can we identify that? So this is a next natural question. And the answer is, yes, we can do it. Okay. So now let me talk about the concept of initial data sets. Okay. So M is a uh, manifold. G is a Riemannian metric, and K is a symmetric CO2 tensor. So given the T, that's just energy momentum tensor, Cauchy problem, or initial value problem, is to construct a Lorentzian manifold, which means the space-time, so that the G bar is an M bar G bar the space-time, right? The G bar, the Lorentzian metric, satisfy the Einstein equation. So we are given T, then we have to solve the G to satisfy the equation. And then there exists an isometric embedding for this manifold, 
into the whole space time, while k is being the second final form of m with respect to the space time. So we can see it's following. Even in the space size slice, of course, this itself is a manual mg. But say you have a it's a sequence of space time, right? So it is corresponding, it has a normal. I call it vector n. Okay. Then with respect to this normal, with respect to the space time, we correspondingly have the second normal form, we call it k. So there is the second of the initial value problem. Okay. So now just some notation. First of all, we know what is mean curvature. Mm -hmm. Again, just a change of the area along the space like because we, we concern space in the beginning only. But now, if we also take k, the single moment form with respect to the timeline normal, then altogether we can define a margin of the trapped surface, which is h to the trace of k in the sigma. So let me draw a picture here to make it easier. So now the in this manifold, then of course, first of all, in this mg, we have this normal. I call it new. This is space normal in this Riemannian slice. With respect to the space time, we have this one. And so h is measure of the area change along the spatial direction. Chase of k over this sigma, this hypersurface, is measuring the change along the time <coughs> direction. So altogether, what does it mean? This is measuring the expansion of the surface under the light direction, the now direction. Okay. So people call it apparent horizon if it's a MOS, because somehow it's saying that okay, the light, even the light cannot escape. It cannot change anything because the change is zero. Correspondingly, the inner trap surface. And then we will define a tensor, which is called pi, which is k minus change kg, is a conjugate momentum tensor. So it's just some notation. And now I can talk about energy density. So if we have an MGK, then of course with a tensor, right? We should on the initial set. We call the TCOCO as M, the TCOI as the GI. They respectively called mass density and current density. So dominant condition is satisfied if mu is greater than the norm of J. Okay. Then at this moment, we may say, okay, it depends on the whole space time. But then I'm a more geometry person. I concern it only all the space size slides, right? So by the Gauss equation, the Kodasi equation, I can express them in terms of G and K only. Only depends on the insulin set. So this is the expression of mu and J only. So they are set. So what can we do later? Let's go back to the question. Right now we have set it up. What is the set? We want to identify a general space size slice in a recovery space. So let's see what should we require. For example, right? In only for geometric setting, do you only consider non-negative scale curvature? Then what about in this setting, we also said, what should we do? So let's see some examples. Mg0, just by direct substitution, we can tell that mu minus j greater than zero corresponds to scale curvature, non-negative. For the hyperboloidal case, actually, we can see this as a umbilical in this data set with x3g g in the entire space. So we will set MGG correspondingly, the scale is greater than negative six, as what we have seen. So of course, in general, we shall expect, we should impose dominant energy condition inside the cube. And then by the uh, by the proof, right, we want to see, okay, how should we prove the theorem? If you have seen the idea before, right, we have to show the cube actually has six packs, doesn't have any belly. So correspondingly, this time, we should consider the surface to have some uh, most on base, which means again, along some light direction, along some light direction, there's no change. So that's why I still have the six packs. So this time, okay, in uh, in the previous session, when we talk about mean temperature being non negative, when the change of the area is increasing, so it's like convex, right? So now, what should be the boundary assumptions? So this time, I have to bring in some more physics into it. So this is a Hamiltonian formulation. So let omega gk be a compact initial set with a boundary, I call it sigma, right? Then I can form a space time on it. So say it's changed according to this uh, timeline direction, which is Vm plus W. So V is a lapse function. W is just a shift vector. Of course, N here just as noted there, right? Just a timeline unit normal. Okay. Then we can define the gravitational Hamiltonian, which is as follows. 
So we can tell that mu and g shows up on the interior, and h and this tends to have contrary momentum on the, on the boundary. So we can tell that it is an interior energy condition, and h and pi should tell you the boundary energy condition. In particular, we can tell, we can tell if k m g k y, if k equals zero, then you just go back to the original case we concerned in the very beginning of this seminar, scalar curvature and mean curvature. So now the proof is here. So given this is just a, uh, we will see how to use this formula. But first of all, let me see that see this why. By the Hamiltonian formula, uh, by the Hamiltonian formulation, we see that mu and j shows up, h and pi shows up. So now in this formula, it shows up as well. It expected because it really follows the Hamiltonian formulation. And here it gives us some form of uh, idea of what the angle should be look like. So can it be bigger? Can it be smaller? It tells the information. And then the key is the following. We have to use this tensor. Okay. So it tells us that you can imagine, right? If this is positive, if this is positive, it will be also positive. So if I can say this part is zero, right? Then I can control something. Just like some contradiction argument. I can control something by this formula. So now let me say the here, here. Oh, sorry, the observation here. We can tell this tensor being zero which means each level set of the particular function, or I can slice the cube in some totally geodesic modes. So which means actually not only the H plus H minus K sigma K is zero, but tensor wise, this is really zero. And then we can use some geometry result to say that, okay, each mod is flat in a certain sense. In particular, I use a result by my friend Martin to talk about how do we show the mod is actually flat. So it is idea. So the the yeah. is a minimal... Sorry, what's the most standard? Most is uh, it stands for that along the now direction, right? Just like the curve, along the now direction, your area has no change. The expansion is zero. I mean, what does the, the acronym mean, right? Marginally out of trap surface. Oh, but uh, marginally oh. out of trap. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, so okay, okay. So here, so let's talk about the comparison theorem first. So let MGK be in a set of some type P. Say, for example, you can tell. A hexagon times co one, so you can imagine hexagon times co one. So as long as satisfies some formal condition in type inside mu greater than j, and some boundary energy condition on the side, then we can really tell that okay. This formula, which means the dihedral angles of M cannot be everywhere, less than those of the Euclidean model. It's just a direct consequence of the formula we have seen, as I have said, right? Just some contradiction argument. You force everything to be positive, but it turns out that it must be zero, right? So then you can tell this idea. But then, okay, again, so at this moment, it is not complete yet. Because again, our goal, not just to say whether the angle can be bigger or smaller than the Euclidean model. What you want ultimately to say, when we can really identify a polyhedral initial data set, and to put it into the calculated space, just like the picture there, we really want to identify those. So what I need is more as the following. Here. Let me skip this. Okay, do it time. Okay. So let MGK be in this sense of crypt type. I need more symmetry to do this, of crypt type. So you satisfy the dominant condition between mu greater than J and the boundary dominant energy condition between the mean curvature is greater than the whole Momentum tensor, pi nu. And everywhere, air, everywhere the dihedral angle between two phases is less than equal power by two. It turns out that, okay, first of all, the surface of the boundary of this cube is exactly the surface of a Euclidean cube, exactly the same one. This is completely flat. Moreover, MGK itself altogether can be embedded in the Minkowski space. So it's set like this. I can patch the whole cube, put that into Minkowski space. If we have this natural energy condition by Hamiltonian formulation. So the idea is as follows. First, I know that all the thing on the surface is flat. And I know that by some OD argument, I can solve for, for some, because of cube, right? I can solve a function going in this direction and going in that direction. So we can tell that the G vector is zero. So the mass density is zero, the current density vector is all zero. So at this point, at least I know it is vacuum. But vacuum doesn't mean Minkowski, right? We have structure, we have curve, et cetera. So how can we show it is really Minkowski? 
So we need one more thing. And now we can jump to more GR, even more GR. So now I have to talk about asymptotic flatness. So we see that in initial data set, it is a little flat in the following sense. Of course, outside the bound, outside some complex set, right? At the infinity, you can expect something like this. So the metric itself is like your Euclidean metric. But the second final form, which means correspond to how curved it is inside the ambient space, right? It's going to zero. At the infinity, spatial infinity. So we call it asymptotic flat. And then we can define some uh, EDM energy momentum factor. So basically, it is saying that, okay, energy is measuring the first derivative of the metric, how it changes in the sphere of infinity. So it measures the spatial infinity. Correspondingly, the ADM momentum P is a vector measuring the behavior of the conjugate momentum tensor at the sphere of infinity. It's all about spatial infinity. So it's the ADM energy momentum vector. So now I can introduce positive mass sphere one. So let MGK be an asymptotic flat initial data set. If the dominant condition is satisfied, which is mu greater than J, then we have the ADM energy momentum vector being future pointing time-like. Moreover, if e equal to P, then e equal to P to zero. Moreover, MGK itself can be put into R31, the Minkowski space. So at this moment, you may ask me, uh, doesn't, don't we just considering a polyhedral, right? We are just considering polyhedral. Then why do I have to consider suddenly as a great effect, infinity? Why do I have to use infinity? It turns out that, okay, they are so close together. They are linked together. So there is the space-time Poisson mass film with corners, with corners. So here, you're saying that assume everything is moved, then we can do all the analysis as usual. But it turns out that if the metric is not smooth, if the con if the uh, second model form is not smooth, we have to do some more tricks to prove the Poisson mass field. In particular, I've shown the following, show the following formula. So basically, you can tell that from this formula, you can say that, okay? If mu is positive, j is positive, and the difference of the mean curvature is greater than the difference of the conjugate momentum tensor, then we can tell that E greater than P, right, just by this formula, because this square term is a bit non-negative. So it turns out that's okay. <clears throat> I can show put much theorem with corners, because this is, again, it is not smooth across some boundary. On the other hand, we can tell that uh, this is blocked here, but I hope you can read it. If E equals P equals zero, then I can still construct, I can put this corner manifold into the uh, Euclidean space. So what does it mean by corner? Let me draw a picture like this. For example, something like this. Something like this. This is a singularity here across some surface. Originally, we can put something like smooth by, but now there's some singularity. But as long as we have some energy condition across this boundary signal, then we can still put some mass field. So now, how can we use it? Is that, okay, Come back to here. Again, from the blue highlighted information, we know that the boundary is always some rectangular prism in the usual Euclidean space. So let me draw a picture here, actually. Here is a curve. Again, the boundary itself is Euclidean. Inside might not be Euclidean, but it is the boundary except Euclidean. So I just patch it with R3, just patch it all together. If you read the metric, if the C was second final form, just patch it outside. Then all together, it becomes an initial data set with corners. And because R3 outside, right? Then of course we know that the energy and all the momentum must be zero. Then what we can do, just use a field I talked about before, put the whole thing in the public space. Which means in particular, this manifold itself, MGK, the cube itself, can be put into the public space. So this is the idea of proving this theorem, connecting the global ADM mass to a compact local region with corners. So this is the idea of the proof. And then moreover, interestingly, I use the Poisson mass theorem to prove a local theorem. While well, it turns out that this local theorem actually implies the global Poisson mass theorem. Why? Because of the following. This is a very interesting. 
It's called the energy redistribution. I mean, or I mean, uh, in mathematics, we call that low temperature location. So imagine, right? I have the asymptotic effect in this particular set. It turns out that by the trick, by uh, some key argument, it turns out that we can put all the energy inside a compact region, say for example, a little bit at the color, so that all the energy go inside, outside is completely flat, completely flat. So the metric becomes delta C1. It's really exactly flat outside, but because all the energy concentrate inside, so it becomes something like this. The energy becomes bigger in this sense. Okay. Then what you can do, we can identify all the faces together. Because flat white, right, I can just scoop it out. What do I mean? Uh, and it will contain the color. If I scoop this out. Okay. So now we have a cube in this sense. You can see all the angles of half a two. And all the surface is flat because again, outside in set space, the usual Euclidean space, I concentrate all the energy inside. And here we can tell that the energy is exactly positive, strictly positive. Okay. But what you have just proved before here, I just told you that as long as the cube has 90 degrees angle, all the surface is flat because they have the energy condition h equal to pi equal to zero. Which means I think inside is mu greater than j. It must be in Minkowski space, right? Then Minkowski space cannot have this condition because Minkowski space mu equal to j equal to zero is better. Right it's called a contradiction. So the contradiction arises from ah, sorry, my back in the beginning. This concentration can be done if we assume on the contrary. It's a profile contradiction. Sorry, my back in the beginning. If we assume on the contrary, e is more than p. Then we can do this energy concentration with distribution. So this uh, so is we can see that okay, global thing proof local thing, local thing proof global thing. So the actual equivalence is in the perspective connecting local geometry to general relativity. Uh, I have, uh, uh, okay. So, uh, can you use this uh, like compact sets ah. that, are, that don't contain, for example, in a black hole station that don't contain the center? Can can you put them to be, like, for example, here? Your cubes? Can you put them here and then uh, make local statements about the that compact region there? Uh, yeah, I mean that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes. I mean, it depends on what you want to prove. Mm -hmm. Of course, I mean itself, the cube itself can be right here, right? Can be anywhere. Right. You put the local film, I don't care about what it goes. But if you want to prove the plasma sphere by this observation, then of course the cube you scoop out right. must be containing some region which is strictly positive energy. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. So now we talk about uh it, you talk about global mass. And I told you why right, the title of the talk is energy and geometry, global and local perspective. Now is the time for local mass. Okay. So again, as a geometer, I start from the uh, gauss bernoulli film, a two-dimensional geometry film first. Okay. So of course, here we have gauss bernoulli film, and for simplicity, I assume the, uh, the topology of the surface is easy, so that's chi sigma is only one. We have this formula, two pi minus the geodesic curvature integral. But what is two pi? Actually, Interestingly, it's just a geodesic curvature of the surface in Euclidean space, integral. It's always too high. So what we can observe is that if the interior, we have positive curvature, this quantity will also have positive curvature. Uh, sorry, it will also be positive, not positive curvature, right? If this is positive, then the boundary difference of the mean curvature will also be non-negative. Yeah. Again, kappa not means the sigma in the Euclidean space, while kappa here just sigma, it's just this boundary in some arbitrary manifold. Okay. So next question, what happens in higher dimension? What we can talk about the interaction between the curvature interior and the outside. Wait a minute. Yeah. So first of all, the revisit Hamiltonian formulation. Again, it is an H, the mean curvature, you measure the boundary curvature. And pi this time shows up, and you will see why. I highlight this boundary term. It turns out that it is the core of definition of quasi-local mass. 
So first of all, general relativity is in from Newtonian mechanics. There is no local mass, but we can define quasi local mass. So go back to Hamilton formulation, right? Because we have the freedom to choose the lapse function and the shape vector. If we choose the lapse function to be one, shape vector to be just zero vector, then actually bundle of mass is defined as follows. So go back to this page to make sure, okay. Say we go one, W equals zero. Then I just have to come concern the integral of the mean curvature, right? So this is the bound of mass. Say for manifold, if the boundary itself can be isometrically embedded into the Euclidean space, correspondingly, it has a mean curvature with respect to the Euclidean space, I call it H naught here. And intrinsically, right, as a metric itself, it has a mean curvature. So the difference of the mean curvature are integral. It go back to bar mass. And correspondingly, we can define more complicated mass by choosing our variation more carefully. For example, it is the choice by Wang Yao, or we can compare the Charles Kilo Yao mass. We choose a particular shape vector in the left function. In particular, it is time like. You can see the normal of this is one, so it's time like. We can define Wang Yao mass. But now I can, I can tell you that, okay, we can be simpler. Because actually, if you read the proof of this paper, they show that Wang Yao mass is positive under some corresponding geometry condition. It's really complicated. It's really complicated. But then now I can tell, okay, I can just be uh, simpler. I'm so lazy. I just choose a now vector instead of a timeline vector. I call it to be one, one, which means I only concern, okay, H and the whole normal pi. I can define to be W sigma. Okay. Again, this is a mean curvature here. I said I take the whole H and pi together here. I can still define the mass. It turns out that it has some good properties. For example, Go back to the classical bound of mass. Why is this good? Why, why is it reasonable? Because of the following. C and 10 into sine and 2, they put the following. If interior has non-negative scalar curvature, if the boundary has a positive mean curvature, which means it has so much energy, right? Interior has positive energy. The boundary has positive energy. Then altogether, the bound of mass is positive. In particular, if n equals 3, actually, bound of mass itself will converge to the ADM energy. So it's a very reasonable mass because it really tells you, you have so much energy. And correspondingly, if I define the new mass W, how I can convince you it is a reasonable mass? Corresponding, I can tell the following. If the mean curvature has really strictly boundary energy, uh, strictly dominant condition, which in the mean curvature is strictly greater than the norm of the conjugate momentum tensor, the interior is satisfied the dominant energy condition. Then we can tell that this quantity will be non-negative. That's why it is a good for the local mass. And actually, it is in the spirit of a bundle extension. So, you know, yes. um, does this the condition to define the Wang Yao mass? The null mean curvature has to be positive. But, uh, yes. here, but here you don't need this condition. Well, actually, in a certain sense, actually, mine is uh, stronger. Yeah, it was stronger, yeah. It is stronger. But the proof is way easier. If somehow I take a shortcut to get a positivity of some reasonable quantity. Yes, I would say so. Mm. Because I skipped the part of a uh, junk equation. Right. Yeah. Because solving junk equation itself is uh, another yeah, complications. So, sorry, there's nobody in the one Huh? There's nobody here in the one Oh, no, it is uh, the, uh, the thing I just defined. It's the tin Yao mass. Yeah, I hope someone will call it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I'll call it the tin Yao mass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah. So just compare, compare. So I mean, uh, just to answer your question, why right? Wang Mas has carefully chosen some complicated vectors okay. to put in the Hamiltonian formulation. But say, okay, I'm Tin Yao Mas, right? Late the lazy mass. I just put one one. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the choice of you vary the surface along that vector or the timeline vector. And, then, it, and in the case that you take W to that, the, 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 the Yeah, which is which, you know, the vector the of norm one. That's yeah, the shift vector, yeah. yeah the norm of one. So yeah, I say one, one. In yeah. the case that you take the shift to be zero, that reduces to the- Final max. The, the B, the what one? The, the brown yoke, the B1 yeah, one. Yeah, the, the B1 one, which in three dimension is the is the ADM. When you go to infinity. And you go to infinity. Yeah, yeah when, when the surface become, uh, the mean, uh, right, become expanding, right? Go into okay. infinity, it becomes ADM energy. Good, yeah. Thank you for the question. Yes. Okay.
So now to the uh, last part of the talk, yeah, I see, yeah, I, I should still have 10 minutes, right? Because I start a little bit late. Okay, yeah, okay. So the last part of here. So now we have seen the uh, global mass, quasi local mass, <coughs> local geometry. Actually, I tell you one more interesting thing that I observed from the uh, from the Gormov's idea. Again, deja vu, we go back to this gas molecule. It actually connects all our topics today. Here, you can tell that. Okay, if this two dimensional surface has non negative gas curvature, right? And because all the characteristics, again, I just say this part just say one. We don't care, I just say one, two, two pi. Because it is uh, which means it is bounded. The integral of the geodesic curvature of the boundary is bounded. And actually, we can see this in the following picture. Let me use this whiteboard again. We can see some interactions between boundaries and interior. It's more than that's got to be Say this time I fix this boundary, I close sigma. Oh, I mean, I, a boundary sigma, I close yeah, but the notation, I follow the four. Okay. So we call mean curvature, which is this curvature here itself, measures the change of area. In this time, it's a length, because it's one dimensional, the change of length, the mean curvature. That's the beginning of our talk today. Measure the change of length. So if I fit inside, for example, a sphere, a hemisphere here. Actually, let more. Hemisphere. So this equator, it becomes the two-dimensional one, sigma two here. It's an equator of the hemisphere. So you can tell that across the along the sphere, right? There's no change of area because it's the maximum point. So the first derivative must be zero. You should the change of area must be zero. So it tells you that okay, kappa here is zero. But here you can tell that I put the sphere, right? The gas curvature is one. By right, a sphere, standard gas curvature is one. The kappa here is zero for the boundary segment. So let me use the color to come to zero. On the other hand, on the other hand, if you feel this equator, just a S1 raised circle with this color. <coughs> this is a piece. I just feel like this. And then you can tell, okay, the area is expanding, but because you can imagine, but you go along outside, it will become a bigger curve, but it will become a bigger curve. In this scenario, correspondingly, of course, interior, because it's a flat, it's in the R2. The gas uh, culture is zero, the capital K. But this time here, let me highlight this. You can expand it, you can imagine expanding, right? The geodesic curvature is actually one. You can expand it, you can imagine. Again, this one is just the same, say the same, but then expand it. So, what you can tell again from gas from the film or this picture, you can tell the exchange of the curvature. If the mean curvature is bigger on the boundary, the interior curvature. Has to be lower. Correspondingly, if the interior curvature is bigger, then the boundary curvature has to be smaller. So it tells you the following: it's some, it's somehow like the conservation of energy. The energy either go inside interior or it has to be released, radiating through the boundary. So now let me introduce the following theorem. That is, actually a conjecture first. Yeah. So Gormov, as a geometer, he uh, he said the following. If I know the interior at the scale curvature has some lower bound, then I know that the integral of the mean curvature has some upper bound. Just as expected as for this picture and the conservation of energy. And let this result, I mean, has not been completely resolved, but we mathematicians uh, have been able to solve some of the cases. So a natural extension to relativity is the following. Given omega gk, not just the metric itself, Going back to Hamiltonian formulation, we can see from this formula, right? Mu and J, the interior energy, and H and pi, the boundary energy, is somehow like exchanging, right? Because say for example, it's the same thing. If it increases, it must decrease. If it increases, it must decrease. 
So it's like, again, just as a picture, it's an exchange of the interior energy and the boundary energy. Then correspondingly, of course, we can talk about the filling, just as uh, the previous talk had mentioned, some uh, partnick break in the mass. Let's talk about filling. So given the uh, initial data set of partnick uh, boundary, so which is the following. Let me draw the picture here. So this is a boundary or something. I call it a sigma itself this time. This is supposed to be boundary or omega, boundary or something. Supposed to be boundary or something. Of course, it is itself as a as a surface itself, right? It has some matching. You have some. I call it alpha there. Yeah. yeah, I call it alpha there. Yeah. So it corresponds to second level form with respect to the time normal. So it's, so it corresponds to MGK if you, if you like this location. But look at the surface, so I call it sigma G alpha. If I prescribe this mean temperature and the energy moment hence I put beta, the H beta here. It's actually the boundary energy altogether. If I prescribe this data, then what I can put inside? Because from the theorem, we can tell that right. I mean from the conjecture, we can tell that yes, it is very, very big. It's very, very big. The boundary energy is too big, right? The interior cannot sustain positive energy. Because if it's too bad, which means all the energy is going out, is going out already. It really is already. So what I can show is the following here. I mean, say, I mean, let me say the conjecture to make it clear what we are proving, right? So you say, if a company doesn't have a boundary, if the interior energy has some lower bound, then I know that the boundary energy has some upper bound. It cannot release too much because I don't have too much to give. Okay. So now it's a theorem. If the boundary energy is really too big. Here is a big number, big enough, such that if the boundary is bigger than C0, then actually inside, you can therefore fill in it with uh, initial data with dominant energy position. Again, the concept is as simple as the exchange of inter interior energy and boundary energy. And the proof of this actually is uh, by contradiction using the space-time post mass with corners, which we have discussed uh, a few uh, minutes ago. Yes. Uh, huh. so does this require you to be uh, does this require a simple flatness in you know uh, oh this is just a compact in this data set right. but what uh to, to prove this field right i have to connect it with uh some extent uh do a cooler neighborhood cooler neighborhood yeah. then from this cooler neighborhood i make a con i mean because uh the corner itself doesn't matter that much i connect it with a simple flat in this data set right. okay then I tell you, okay, if, if there is a building here, if there's a building here, all to, first of all, all together, it becomes an asymptotic flat in this data set. Okay. But then it tells you that, okay, we must have some uh, contradiction because now this one, I can tell actually the energy by careful construction of the top, I can tell you this uh, energy, right again. But by the original first mass film, if, if there is, if everywhere, it's moving in J. Then it must be equal to equal P. So this one is a contradiction. The P is a construction of this particular user set. Yes. yes. So it itself, the field itself concern what happens along mm -hmm. this company user set, but to use a global one. So again, we can see that global energy condition or ADM energy correspond to local geometry. So this is very interesting. That's how I say the local geometry, global geometry, local energy, global energy, they are all connected. And actually they can be linked by gauss the theorem. Yes. And of course there is another proof, which is a bias by Dirac operator. This is done by, uh, I don't know how to pronounce this name, Wang Lot, right? This is the French. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know, yeah, but I mean, I just, yeah, I, I just say his, uh, yeah, just the name. So there's another proof. He doesn't use a, a positive mass theorem. He just use some, uh, Divide operator on compact manifolds to achieve the same thing. Yes. So thank you for your attention today. Uh, we'll we'll take some questions quickly, but Tinyan's around, so you should ask him some questions um, after. Are there any questions? Yes. Uh, so I'm not I'm not a mathematician, so I just want to make sure I fully understand. Uh, so is the idea that. Uh, um, so my understanding of the Gauss-Bonnet theorem, hmm. uh, I only know its applications to 2D surfaces. Yes. But like, 
um, the current the, the mean curvature is equal to to two pi times the Euler number. Yep, yep, yep. And the Euler number is some statement about the number of vertices and, and, and like like the, the oh yeah some topological structure. Yeah, some topological exactly. structure. Exactly. Yes. And the, the idea is to write a generalized version of this for three and higher. If I understand correctly, the idea is to write a generalized version of this for three and higher dimension, or have some sort of statement, or does uh, it already exist? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, in a sense, you're right it's because uh, Gauss bond theorem, this really elegant beautiful theorem, in higher dimension, it has some analog, but it is actually not <laughs> as beautiful, not as simple as this. It's we call some uh, far off and no characters, class, chain class, etc. Right, those those horrible things. I mean, I guess I don't know algebra, but say in terms of geometry, uh, what you want to say is okay. You give me some curvature condition. Yeah. Can I really tell you what space it is in? For example, for geometry itself, I concern whether it is really R3 is flat. But as somehow like a GR, I pretend to be a physicist. I concern whether the thing can be put into Minkowski space. Right? But, Minkowski, but any space like this can be curved like Minkowski space. But there's a difference in how we can extend, somehow, as you said, right? extend the Gauss when the film in high dimension and into Minkowski space. Maybe maybe I can just say a few words huh. to kind of summarize what's been said, because yeah. I think it's there's a lot of material here, but it's oh. kind of um <laughs> it's hard to to take it all in. The basic idea is that um triangles on a sphere are fat, right? They have like fat angles, right? And that's yeah. because the curve is just positive. Now GR, the whole basis of assumption in GR, Russell GR, is that the local energy density is positive, and that replaces the positive curvature on the sphere. And the question is, well, what happens to the angles and the convexity of the boundary? Do they behave just like the two-dimensional surfaces that we know and love and that we draw as kids? The answer is they do. That's basically it. And assuming the energy condition, you can make some sort of so you use this Gauss Bonnet equivalency because the, the curvature and the surf of the boundary has to trade off between the point. Yes, this is the idea. Yeah. The ball. And if you assume the dominant energy condition, huh. then that's placing some sort of constraints on the shape and like what kind of geometry we can have in the middle or on the boundary, depending on what on everything. Yeah, on everything. Yeah. The relationship between the angles, the relationship between the mean curvature of the faces. And the relationship between the curvature inside, right? These all are related in a way that mirrors and generalizes exactly what we know for surfaces. And this is the remarkable thing that GR is sensitive to to the drawings that we do as kids. It's it's hard coded in the geometry. This will also true for things around black holes, for cubes in space times, etc. So, yeah. Maybe I should ask. Yeah. <laughs> There's a beautiful relation you've written there. So if I am a little kid, huh. yeah. drawing triangles and the squares huh. and stuff on a sphere, I'm still working in flat space, right? Huh. Euclidean space. Huh. So which term will go to zero? Is it that capital? Oh, oh, no, 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 no. So when you're drawing stuff on a sphere, yeah. it, you're actually on the sphere. Oh, so you're not okay. in your case. That's just that I'm embedding in 3D yeah. That's just because space. you're a human being. <laughs> okay, so you're saying for the mathematics that is irrelevant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For, yeah. Okay. No, but actually, if you are a kid, I will just give you a juice box. Then, yeah, it tells all the things. Yeah, the juice box tells you all the things. Well, well, <laughs> and I, I think I'm still in flat space. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the point, the point, the point here, the point here is that, like, from the perspective of the surface, you're not in flat space. You're on the sphere. Okay. So when you measure, when you're when you're a kid, let's say you're an ant, this is a famous thing you see in the history books. When you're an ant on a sphere and you measure the angles and the triangle, you'll measure more than 90 degrees, right? That's the intuition you should be having. You're, you're a kid in an intrinsic geometry. Right. <laughs> kid in an intrinsic geometry. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody told me how to think like that. <laughs> so I, I see this correspondence between the, the triangles and, and GR and... Uh, can you translate this to the quasi local mass and the, the global? Oh, yes, there's, there's a theorem. Yeah, that's true. I can uh, say it here. Yes, I'll put it here. That is true. I mean, a very, a very good question. So maybe we should preface your answer with just that. Oh, okay. that um, uh, the, the challenge of quasi local mass is to understand how boundary geometry and interior geometry are related. The, the idea of quasi-local mass, why people are interested, is because somehow 
you want to just look at something from the outside and get a get an understanding of what those properties imply about the inside, right? Or if so, if you believe that things to be true of the inside, what should the outside look like, right? That whole relationship. Now, the amazing thing is that you don't need GR for this. This is already true at the level of kids in 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 preschool when they draw pictures on the sphere. You know, when they draw triangles on the sphere, if it's if it's a sphere and it's positively curved, the angles and the boundary geometry will have certain constraints. And for quasi-local mass, these uh, you know these definitions that we've seen by Tinyao, et cetera, they kind of mimic exactly the same thing that you would generalize from these surface drawings, but now in higher dimensions. So the the angles between the faces uh, of a cube, say around a black hole, and the curvature of the faces of that cube will have to satisfy certain inequalities. Yeah, and you can actually prove this, and this is what Tinyao has been doing. And actually, you can, I mean, just to, I mean, uh, as a math guy, right, just to be more explicit, there's a field that might interest you, because you mentioned the angles, right? Again, H M pi is a boundary energy. When you're opposed to the infinity, then we're supposed to get the ADM uh, energy and the moment vector, that's true. But what if we go back to the question, like, for example, a cube. If I expand the cube bigger and bigger and bigger, can we still get ADM energy when I mass? And that is true. Actually, we can, it's encoded in this information. So what he is telling me that the energy moment vector on the surface plus the integral of the angle along the edges, it really gives you the ADM energy and momentum. So actually, the angle itself also encodes the quasi-local mass. That's exactly what Martin said. Yeah. This really encodes the quasi-local mass in, in that uh, aspect. Yes. And then there's another remarkable thing, which is that in the proofs of all this, right, or everything we've been saying is all about like, you know, local things and, and quasi-local things, Fine, right? The amazing thing is that in the proofs of all these things, you actually have to take these global viewpoints and you have to kind of extend things out to infinity, prove things about infinitely sized things to prove things about local things, and then go backwards. And as Tinya was saying, turns out there's an equivalence between the local view viewpoint and the quasi local, sorry, the global viewpoint and the quasi local viewpoint. This is something the kids in high school or in preschool would not have expected. So, that the angles are fat on a sphere. We all knew that since the age of five, four, three. But the fact that one has to consider asymptotic and flat space times, go back and forth between quasi local and global, as a kid, we wouldn't have expected that. I think that's one of the surprises here. Thank you. Yes. I guess I have another question. Yeah. So you took uh, like some polyhedron with huh. some initial data in it, like yes. corners and everything. And then you have to get this global approach. So there's a you is it that you embedded in a and I thought you demand that this M is embedded in some space time that's asymptotically flat. Well, I don't have to just consider as like initially set level. I don't consider the whole space time. I just you see all the proof here, just only the initial data set. Yeah. I, I don't have to construct the whole space time beforehand. Yeah, I don't but, have to. But you, but you're but you're saying that but you're demanding that it, it, it can be seen as something in an asymptotically flat space time. I, I, like, initial oh. data set and if you want to embed it in a space time you're welcome to do so but you is don't it, have to is that embedding unique uh, there was some statement earlier about like pds that didn't quite follow sorry um, oh i don't think you need to embed it in the beginning i just consider like a geometry point of view it's, it's actually not an embedding it's an extension it's a slight difference so an embedding oh, is okay. you put something in something yeah. yeah an extension is you take something and you just add something else okay right. he's yeah, just yeah. adding an extension I just add, so and then, example, this way i put it into a plane no no i mean i extend it so put it also extend it into a plane and I, and, and, and the extensions aren't unique of course no? okay because yeah. you can extend it in however way you want on a okay. tuesday you might want to do it one way or thursday a different way but I mean, I thought I extend it, right? It is still a uh, Riemannian manifold. Yes. I don't cons I don't extend it into the vertical, the time direction, right? I extend it space direction. Okay. That's maybe what yeah. I can say. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Any more questions? If not, then we should thank our big. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, let's have some cake. Yeah. yeah. <laughs>